Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Engineering Insights for this month. And today we're going to be covering the new features released in V0.21. My name is Ed Marcus. I'm a developer evangelist at Hedera. And today, Simi, who is a developer advocate at Hedera, will be covering these new features with me. Hey, Simi. Hey, Ed. How's it going? It's going great. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for the intro. Awesome. And so what are some of the new features that we'll be covering today? Yeah, so a couple of the new features that came out in the 21 release was auto account creation and support for ECDSA keys. Um, so I guess first we'll get started with covering uh, this feature. This feature came out of uh, HIP32. So the auto account creation feature is where you can create an account um, using an account alias. The alias can be one of either the ED25519 or the ECDSA, um, and you can see the specific support there. Um, the alias account ID takes a 0.0, .0 alias format. So 0.0, .0 is, is pretty standard with the way that we do all over en other entities. Um, but in this case, you have the public key inserted um, in that alias bracket there. Uh, the alias, when you create an alias, um, it can't be a key list or a threshold key or a delegatable contract ID. So when you create this alias, it's just a simple public key um, that you can just generate from any of the SDKs. Um, the way that you create an account from this alias is through a transfer transaction. So here on the right, you can see we created an ED25519 key um, as the account alias. And then next we do this transfer. And um, down at this bottom line right here, you can see the transfer to the account alias, converting it to an account ID um, of 10 HBAR. Once that transfer executes, what really happens is the account create transaction is created for that new account that is tied to the alias. And then second, the transfer transaction transfers the transfer amount, which is uh, 10 HBAR, minus the transaction fee to create the, the new account. So the resulting account has about like nine point something um, HBARs in it as its initial balance. And um, in the transfer transaction, you can actually do multiple uh, transfers to multiple aliases to create those accounts. Um, so this way, if you wanted to create an account, you can kind of create it just by generating that public key. And then it realizes um, as an account on Hedera, once that transfer transaction um, executes. I see, Simi, this is super helpful and super clear. And so just to confirm here, then the person paying for the fees there to create the new account would be uh, that new account. The person paying for the fees um, is the person that is transferring HBAR into that alias account. So um, someone else can create the alias. And if if you ask, if I ask you to transfer 10 HBARs to that alias, um, that that transaction fee for that creating that account will come out of the 10 that you're transferring to that alias, if that makes sense. Perfect. It does make sense. Cool. Cool. So going on to the next slide, um, I just wanted to make a point to say that the alias um, for the account does not replace the account public key. And what does that mean? Um, on the right, you can see the response to an account info query for this account. And um, you can see that the key, on the, the key on the account is a separate property. And then the account alias key is a separate property. So if you update your, let's say your account keys, it will only update the key value. And um, at this time, once you have a alias on your account, you cannot update it. So um, at this at this stage of the feature, this alias key is immutable. So once you have your account has an alias key, um, you can't update it. And then you can also see here that once you create that um, account by transferring to the account alias, the memo um, field has auto created account as a note as to how this account was created. 
All right, so moving on to the next slide. Um, so this feature introduces uh, the concept of parent and child transactions. So as I had mentioned in the previous slide, once you initiate the transfer to the account alias, um, in the background, it actually submits an account create transaction first and then completes the transfer transaction once that um, account is created. So in this scenario, the parent transaction is a transfer transaction that the user submitted the child transaction is the account create transaction that um, sort of happened in the background. Um, the way that you can identify um, child transactions to a parent is by a nonce value. Uh, this is just an identifier um, after the transaction ID um, to show that this was a child to another parent. So the parent and child transaction IDs share the same um, payer ID and timestamp. And you can see that down here um, in the example where you have the same payer account ID, you have the same um, transaction valid start time here. And then um, except that for the child transaction ID, you have that nonce value of one because um, this was triggered by the transfer transaction. Um, the way that you can get the records for the child transactions is by setting up the transaction record query in the SDKs, and then you'll use that set include children uh, boolean flag equal to true, and that will return the list of all child transactions that were associated to the parent. Hey, Simi, so to clarify one thing here, you mentioned that the parent and the child transaction share a few attributes. Can you go over those again? And I think I heard you say something about the consensus timestamp and also the transaction valid start. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so the parent, the parent, uh, well, transaction IDs in general are composed of the pair account ID and the transaction valid start time and, and second dot nanosecond format. Um, so the transaction valid start time is the time the transaction begins to be valid on the network. So you can set a transaction valid start time for the future and then it won't uh, leave the queue until um, that it has reached that specific date and time. So um, that's what you see here. The, uh, with the parent and child transaction IDs, you see that the, um, the payer ID and the transaction valid start time are exactly identical. The only difference is, is that um, the child transaction has that nonce value of one, but that's how you can kind of view the relationship between the parent and child because if you know it has a nonce value you know it has a parent and um does that answer your question i think i need to touch on the consensus timestamp and which i'll jump to the next slide yeah sure. Um, I, it does answer the question and it's nice to see it here in this slide with an example yeah so the consensus timestamp is a is a timestamp of when the nodes reach consensus on the transaction after it was submitted for consensus. And so you can see that on the top line here. And you'll notice that um, the child transaction record, which is the account create transaction, is one nanosecond um, ahead or before the transfer transaction. And the reason for that is, is as I explained, the account create transaction occurred first and the transfer transaction occurred second. Um, usually in parent-child transaction relationships, all the child transactions occur after the parent, but this is a specific case where it occurs before uh, the parent transaction was triggered. Uh, you'll also notice that in the child transaction, we have this memo field that's populated um, where it auto-created account. So that's the note that's just provided that this account was created, you know, by transferring um, oh, by an account by creating an account alias. And then below that, you see the alias um, for that account. And then in that last line there for parent consensus timestamp. So normally for child transactions, you would see this field populated. But in this case, because this account create transaction occurred before the parent, um, this value is going to be null. Um, so now that you've created this new account, how do you return the account ID? So you have a few different ways that you could do that. Um, you can request the account info 
using the account alias and return the account ID that way. You can also request the children receipts from the parent by using the transaction receipt query and setting the children equal to true, it'll return a list and then you can grab it from the list there. Um, these are all ways that you can do it um, through the various queries um, that you can, or queries that you can build um, using the SDKs. So understanding that the child has a nonce value, the nonce value for the account create transaction will be one. So down at the bottom there, you can also just build the query to where the transaction ID is a transaction ID of the parent and set the nonce value equal to one. And you can just directly access the new account ID there. Um, you can do the same for the transaction record query as well. There are also um, mirror node REST APIs that support this feature. So you can search by transaction ID and nonce value and uh, return the information for that transaction using the transactions API. Um, you can also just search by the parent tra transaction ID. So without the nonce value, and then it should return all associated children to that as well. And now for this um, next slide, um, there's a use, use case there that was um, pretty much for wallet providers where they maybe want to create free Hedera accounts for their users. You can kind of do it this way because um, you can create a public key um, for that user. And then once that user transfers funds into that account, then the user kind of pays for that transaction fee. So in that sense, um, the wallet provider is kind of creating these Hedera accounts for free. So in the initial 21 release of this feature, you can use the account alias in place of the account ID for the transfer transaction, um, the account balance query, and the account info query. And uh, the alias uh, is immutable here. So once, once it is set, you, you cannot um, update it. And then in the 23 release, um, we are going to allow users to use the alias in all places um, of the account ID. So any other transaction and queries where you have to enter the account ID field, you can also enter the alias and it should uh, map to the same, um, map to the account that you're looking to submit the request for. Um, aliases for accounts that did not have an ex existing alias can be updated to have an alias, but once an account um, again has an alias, you cannot go back and um, update that again. So once an account has an alias, um, that is immutable. Any other questions there, Ed? I mean, maybe going back one slide, where would I see the transaction payments, you know, the, the, the fees associated with these transactions? Would that be in the parent or in the child record? Yeah, so um, in the parent child relationships, all of the fees, transaction fees associated with the children are wrapped up in the parent. So if you get the record of the parent, um, it should be a sum of the transaction fees should be a sum of um, all of the child transactions. If you get the record of a child transaction, you'll notice that the transaction fee is zero and the transfer list is zero. Uh, but that just means you have to roll up to the parent to see all of the fees and transfers. Got it. Understood. That helps. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Cool. Sounds like we can uh, move on to the next feature, which is support for the ECDSA keys. Um, this one's pretty straightforward. Um, if you're used to generating the ED25519 keys using the SDKs, um, it's it's pretty similar to that. You just do private key generate, and then you can generate this key type. Um, you can use this key. So you have the option to create keys and key lists um, in Hedera, and you can create either of those by um, using the ECDSA key, or you can do a mix of the ECDSA keys and the ED keys together. And um, you can use either of these key types, um, as we talked about in the previous feature, um, to create an alias, an account alias from. Yeah, so the, this feature is pretty straightforward, I think. We have support for these keys now, and if, if you are looking to use um, this key type, then um, we have it now available. And I think um, that's all that we have for today. Is there anything else that I missed, Ed? I think that covered it all, Simi.
Um, so with that, you know, I want to say that was great. Thank you so much, Simi, for these explanations and examples. And for everyone else, please stay tuned for updates, documentation, and examples that will be coming related to this release and also to the next release, which is 0 0.22. And that release actually includes some major updates for our smart contract service. Um, so with that, thank you, Simi, and we'll see you all in the next Engineering Insights. Thanks so much, Ed. Appreciate it.